All right, so good morning. Uh, first thing you will notice today is that I'm not Keith. Uh, my wife looks at me and says, what are you doing? So, uh, so, so what I'm doing, uh, I, I wanted to uh, talk just a minute, just for a few minutes, uh, about um, effectual calling, uh, because uh, this is what Keith has been teaching on uh, recently. And there was a question, uh, a question uh, that was asked a couple of times in various ways in it, in, over the last few weeks. And it, and it had to do with uh, whether God can effectually call you over time or whether effectual calling happens in a moment. And so I just want to take just a, just a few minutes um, to uh, sort of briefly answer that question. Um, and uh, Keith asked to, to just uh, uh, teach for just a few minutes, and then I'm actually going to um, going to skip out uh, and go to the uh, older children's class, uh, the teenagers class, and sit in on that class um, because I just don't like you guys. So I'm just kidding. No, no, really, I love y'all. Um, okay, so so here so here's the thing um, about effectual calling. But first, actually, let's pray. Okay. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for a group of uh, Christian believers after you and after your word and your ways and who desire to know you more and, and uh, to delight in you, Lord. So we pray that as we, uh, as we talk uh, briefly about effectual calling and as Keith uh, teaches, continues to teach this morning, that you'd bless us, Lord. We, we pray that you would bless uh, the, the uh, two children's uh, classes um, the older children and the younger children, that you bless them, Lord, uh, that you would bless the teachers and, uh, and help them, Father. Uh, and Lord, that, that everything we do would be glorifying to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, um, so what I wanted to do was uh, I wanted to read from the larger catechism and then look at, at scripture proof. So this is the larger catechism. The shorter catechism was originally for children. Um, so, you know, yeah, I know, like, so little, little children, you know, Asher's age and so forth would be catechized with the shorter catechism. This was for, um, adults. Uh, the larger catechism was for adults. So, um, it gets a little more, it gets a little deeper, um, and answers actually answers some of the questions, but, uh, we really don't need the catechism to answer this question. Um, but I, I just think it ties everything together so neatly. That's, um, that's the, the reason I'm going to it. So uh, question 66 says this, and, and just think about this. What is the union which the elect have with Christ? So think about that, the union uh, that the elect have with Christ. Now, um, there's probably, if you're looking for a catch-all category to talk about um, your relationship with Christ, um, you could say that you're, you know, you say you're justified in Christ, you're saved in Christ, you're you're uh, sanctified in Christ, you're adopted in Christ, um, and so forth. But you could say you're united to Christ, and that is a that is sort of an umbrella term that describes and subsumes all the rest. So what is the union which the elect have with Christ? And here's the answer. The union which the elect have with Christ is the work of God's grace, whereby they are spiritually and mystically, yet really and inseparably, joined to Christ as their head and husband, which is done in their effectual calling. I like that. Okay, and now it says, uh, the next question is, what is effectual calling? And it says, effectual calling is the work of God's almighty power and grace, whereby out of his free and special love to his elect, and from nothing in them moving him thereunto, he doth in this accepted time invite and draw them to Jesus Christ by his word and spirit, savingly enlightening their minds, Renewing and powerfully determining their wills, speaking only speaking of the uh, drawing to, to salvation, so as they, although in themselves dead in sin, are hereby made willing and able to freely answer his call and to accept and embrace the grace offered and conveyed therein. Now there's a lot more in the catechism. Uh, the next few questions continue to elaborate on this point, but because I'm not going to teach for the whole hour, uh, I wanted just to, to hit those two questions. And then think about a couple of pictures in Scripture that would exclude the idea that we are gradually effectually called. Okay, um, so so here's here's a few pictures. Um, in Ephesians two five through six, it says, "Even when we were dead in sins, God hath quickened us together with Christ." Now that, that word "quickened" is is the word "made alive." Uh, 
It, and and it's, a, it's, it's a zoopaeo, it's, it's a word where we actually get the word zoo from. Uh, zoe is the word for life, um, and that's where we get the word zoo, living things belong at the zoo. So one minute you're, you're dead, and the next minute you're alive. Um, you know, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, you can't, okay, so here's another picture. Um, given to Christ, uh, John 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. So there's a moment when you're given to Christ and you're either his or you're not. You either belong to him or you don't. Um, what about, uh, what about uh, uh, the, um, let's see, Ephesians 2, 6 through 7. He and, and he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Um, that it, so, so this is speaking spiritually of a spiritual resurrection that happens where you were dead and now you're alive. You were dead to God, now you're alive to God. Um, you can't be partly dead. You can't be mostly dead. Um, you, you know, the Princess Bride tried to say that that was possible. It's not possible. That's not a theological movie. Um, it's a funny movie, but not theologically accurate. He, he was a prophet when it came to masks. The Dread Pirate Roberts, right? He said in the future we'll all be wearing masks and so forth. That, that was pretty, that was pretty uh, interesting. But beyond that, there's no good theology in that movie. Uh, you can't be partly dead. So, so there is a moment when you are brought from death to life, and at that point you are spiritually united to Christ and seated with him as part of his mystical body in the heavenlies. Um, spiritually, because where the head is, there the body is as well, theologically and mystically. Um, now it says, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians six seventeen is another example. Uh, now, now in context, this passage says, let us not be joined to a prostitute, because he that is joined to a prostitute is one flesh with her, okay? So speaking of the seriousness of, of the sex act, okay, um, and, uh, and, and how... You know, so it says, don't do that. But then the next verse says, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So there is this union with Christ that happens um, at conversion, ineffectual calling. Now, you can't be partly joined with Christ or gradually joined with Christ. You are either joined with him or you're not, you know. Um, so again and again, the Bible talks about this. Um, uh, John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Again, can't be partly dead, partly alive. Um, we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. Um, Ephesians 5, uh, 30. Um, you know, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So you either are a branch or you're not a branch. You're either connected to Christ um, as a branch or you're not. There's no gradual connecting. Um, so again and again, and, and there's lots and lots of these uh, that 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 uh, I want to go into um, more fully in a few at a future lesson, either on Wednesday night or Sunday morning. But all this to say, um, there is a time when you are born again, and the moment before you were not born again. <laughs> so there's a moment in time when you were born again. Um, there's a moment in time when that effectual call takes effect. Now, very briefly. Famous last words. Um, it seems like sometimes to people that they are gradually coming to Christ. That's our experience, but the scriptures demonstrate and are very clear that it, it happens in a moment, as I've just gone through and shown. So this is where our experience has to take a, take a back seat to the scriptures. But the scriptures do talk about um, the fact that uh, it's possible to have what are known as the common operations of the spirit, okay? Um, <clears throat> so in the next passage in the catechism, the next one, it says, are the elect only effectually called? And again, when we're talking effectual calling, we're talking about that moment in time when God unites you to Christ. He convinces your will, he changes you, he gives you the new heart. Which again, you either have the new heart or you don't. There's not you don't have half a heart of stone, half a heart of flesh. It is all or nothing, right? Um, he says, "I will take out the heart of stone, and I will give you the heart of flesh." Okay, so so it's but but so are the elect only effectually called? And here's the answer: all the elect and they only are effectually called, although others may be and often are outwardly called by the ministry of the word. And have, and have some common operations of the Spirit. 
who, for their willful neglect and contempt of the grace offered to them, being justly left in their unbelief, do never truly come to Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is speaking of an, of an outward um, effect of the preached word. It may convince your dead conscience. It may make you feel, you know, like you, you know, it may, it may persuade you. But, but without that effectual call, there's no spiritual life. Okay, so that's the difference. Um, we've got examples of these uh, sorts of people in the scriptures. Uh, most notably would be who? Anybody think of someone who outwardly participated in the, um, the, the, uh, the um, common operations of the Spirit? I think of one in the Old Testament, one in the New. Judas. Judas, yes, exactly. Very good, Amy. So Judas. Judas was doing miracles even, as far as we know. He was baptizing uh, people. He was, um, you know, but he was lost the whole time. Uh, and he was never, he never had a believing heart that loved Jesus. And that's another thing. You either love Jesus or you don't. There's no like, there's no partial thing going on here. Um, you either, as I'll talk about in the sermon, you either love the brothers or you don't. Uh, you know, uh, by this we know that we, um, by this we know that we know God, John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, if we love the brothers. So there's no, there's no, there's not a, I love you guys, Kind of a little bit, sort of, okay? It's either all or nothing. Um, there, so there are new affections or there are not. Um, you know, Saul in the Old Testament is an example of someone who was, um, you know, who, who was uh, operating uh, with the outward effects uh, and, and even in a, in a supernatural way at times without being uh, in all likelihood born again. Uh, Simon Magus is another example, the, the magician Simon who... Um, he, he is baptized, he responds to the outward call, and he responds in, in a way that he should. Um, but in the very same passage, Peter says that he is, he is going to perish. He says, your money perish with you, meaning that you will perish. Um, so, and he said, because your heart is not right, and you have no, neither part nor lot with us in this matter. Um, so, th so this is the um, th this is the teaching um, in brief. I want to go. I want to, like I said, I want to take longer um, to to uh, answer, um, um, you know, to to, to uh, answer at length. <laughs> we'll take longer to answer at length um, at, a, at a future time. But any any questions as I go to hang out with the kids? All right. So again, experience takes a back seat to Scripture, but even experience can be explained with the Scripture. In other words, you can have the, the benefit of the common operations of the Spirit without the new affections, without being born again. And sometimes that happens. You know, sometimes you have the outward particip or the, the um, outward participation, um, um, and um, and you know, you're and then all of a sudden God saves you from that. You know, he saves you from religiosity, if we could say, uh, and makes you truly born again, where, whereby you love Christ, you hate your sin, you love the brothers, and, uh, and, and you'll know when that happens. Um, I, you know, I think it's happened to all of you um, because uh, nobody is twisting your arm uh, to get you to, you know, be at church or to get you to pray or to get you to love one another. Um, so, okay, all right. All right, Keith. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but now you get to listen to me for about thirty minutes. Yay! <laughs> thank you. Thanks, brother. So, and just to expand upon that a little bit, uh, the reason I asked Pastor Philip just to give a, a quick introduction, or you know, just expand on uh, just his scholastic background and his experience is over the course of the last couple of weeks, I do appreciate, you guys have been great. I mean, you really have. Uh, but, and these questions are good. They're not dumb questions. And so we've, we've heard these questions. We, we ended last week, just this question, is it theoretically possible that, that while I'm, the external call is going out, is it possible that I'm actually being regenerated at the same time? Can regeneration be this gradual process? So that question was asked, and the answer that we gave right at the end was, no, we don't believe that's biblical. Uh, but then even in previous weeks, there was just this thought of, well, it seems like the Spirit is calling me, and maybe he's been calling me for months or years, so you know, can my effectual call 
be running in parallel to my external call? And again, as Philip just explained, the answer is no, but that's not to deny all of us are being drawn to Christ. It's not like, well, I, I guess there could be any situation. It, I guess you could be completely dead and you've never had a thought about God and then all of a sudden he calls you. That could happen. But normally we're all being called, but what we're experiencing is this external call. So if we're sitting in church and hearing the word, that's part of God's external call. It's not the effectual call. It's not regeneration. If you're having a conversation with maybe a wiser Christian and they're explaining the gospel to you, that is part of your external call. If you're reading a book about Christianity or if you're reading your Bible, that is God speaking to you, but it is an external call. The internal call when the Holy Spirit acts is an instant, as Philip described. And one analogy that we can use, um, I'm glad Philip didn't use it because now I get to use it. So if you think about, let's think about physically now because we can wrap our brains around, it, around this. There is a point that we call conception. This is a distinct moment in time. So we don't say that a woman is kind of pregnant. She's either not pregnant or she is. And the line that divides that is this moment of conception. And we know biologically how that works, but there's a distinct moment in time. You're either pregnant or you're not. So take that same concept, and that's what we're saying here. Yes, you are experiencing God working in your life through his external call, but there's a unique moment in time when your effectual call and regeneration occurs. And uh, I love this graph for me because it helps answer some questions. So if you imagine, you know, you're trying to be in two places at once, so you can't be dead in sin and alive to God. You can't be in both places. You're either dead, you either have a heart of stone, or you're born again, and you have a heart of flesh. You can't have like 20% flesh and 80% stone. It is a unique moment in time when your effectual call comes, but you're still experiencing in various ways this external call. The other thing, which was nice because I'm an engineer and I like the way things line up. You, while you are dead, you are in a state of sin. You can't be in a state of sin and a state of grace at the same time. It's an either or. So when you're effectually called, when God regenerates your heart, it happens in an instant, and it's all or nothing. When you're effectually called, you're 100% effectually called. When you're regenerated, when that heart of stone is replaced with heart of flesh, it's 100%. It happens in an instant. And in that same instant, where you were in the state of sin, you are immediately, in that same instant, translated into a state of grace. So that's what we see this picture in the Bible. We have this experience, but it is part of this external call that we all go through. And then, at the appointed time, which is different for everyone, the Holy Spirit illumines our mind, flips the light switch, and God regenerates the heart. So that's what we're talking about. So, uh, with what Philip said, and uh, just those additional comments, is there any questions on that? It's okay if you were raised learning something different, if there's anything that doesn't quite jive, uh, feel free to ask those questions now. Amy. So, we haven't gotten to sanctification yet, right? So, um, we haven't, but I will say this. What we're going to see is that sanctification begins at this point in time. So, the heart of flesh, it's, that's, I mean, obviously, I'm just clarifying. That's not kind of the end of the story. That's not, you know. No, and you weren't. Sin, and now you're not in sin. Like, there's, right. there's still a process, but that's not part of the external call. That's after the effectual call. Yeah, and so you weren't in class last week. That's actually where we ended things. Um, you can watch it on tape. But I made the comment that, you know, right now, this is where we are in the order of salvation. We've studied election. We've studied effectual call. We're right now studying regeneration. 
And if anybody wasn't here, there are handouts in the back, so feel free to get a handout. I believe there's still a few back there. But I made the comment, you know, this isn't the end of the story. Somehow we got to get to glory. So our timeline, which the order of salvation timeline I've got in green here, you know, we still got to make progress to get over here. But we're not there yet. We're taking this in an orderly fashion. Effectual call, regeneration. We've still got to look at your jaspogee. We've got to look at justification, adoption, sanctification, perseverance of the saints. So glorification, that's all part of it. And we will get there. Um, but this is, this is a hovering point where there's a lot of stuff going on. We're going to review everything that's going on. But then we got to move forward because we got to get over here to glory. I think that's where, that's where we get, well, I get stuck. It's like, well, I'm supposed to have a heart of flesh now. You know, I'm supposed to be regenerated. Why am I still having these, you know? Um, having a heart of flesh and being regenerated doesn't mean that sin is removed. Well, I wish you were here last week. So another thing that we talked about was we looked at the different states of sin. We kind of went back and did a review. We said that Adam and Eve in the state of innocence had the ability to not sin. Now, sin didn't exist, but they had complete ability to either sin or not sin. God gave them one command. Don't do this one thing. They disobeyed and they fell into a state of sin. When they fell into a state of sin they lost the ability to not sin. They lost the ability to not sin, and there was no neutrality. So it's not that, well, okay, I can no longer please God, but I'm just kind of getting through and I'm not doing anything to displease him. There's no neutrality. You cannot please God in the state of sin. Spiritually, there is nothing you can do spiritually pleasing to God. So in the state of sin, man lost the ability to not sin. When they're born again, through regeneration, you now have a heart of flesh. You actually have been giving back that same state that Adam and Eve had in the garden. So anyone who's saved is in the exact state as Adam and Eve in the garden. You have the ability to sin and the ability to not sin. Now the difference is sin still exists in the world. It didn't exist in the garden. And we are still subject to sin. That is the continual battle of the spirit with the flesh. So sin doesn't go away, but even through that process, God sanctifies us. Floyd? So you're saying, even though you're regenerated, you could fall out of that situation? If, you, if something happens. No. Um, let me clarify. <clears throat> when you're regenerated, you can still sin. We all do. I'm not aware of anyone who has lived a sinless life after they were saved. Uh, if that person exists, I would have to question, you know, whether they really are saved. Well, you can't they're... lose your salvation. That's the point. But as a redeemed individual saved, you're still subject to sin. We all sin. We all stumble in many ways. You can't lose your salvation and then be regenerated again. This is a one-time deal. And at this point, this is where Paul talks about he will preserve you in Christ Jesus. And although you may be subject to sin, you will never truly in an effectual way fall away. Your salvation is secured. Your name is written in the book of life. Nothing can have your name removed from the book of life. So to say that you could lose your salvation, again, we could go to scripture. There, there's nothing that talks about losing your salvation. You're still subject to sin, but the Bible never talks about losing your salvation once God says you. Ross? I was going to say, ask the best explanation I've ever heard because normally me and her family almost have been fist fights over talking about that's the same not words. True. And, that's like, not true. and I've been on both sides. I, I you know sometimes I've been like, okay, so you can't lose salvation and you know and other times it's like nah it's probably like possible, but yeah, it, it's been like an ongoing discussion we've had for years. Well we me and you. Okay, so I'm almost have fist fight with you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think the scripture is very clear. 
Scripture does not talk about losing your salvation. It says God will persevere. That's what we're going to talk about, the P in your gospel sheet. Perseverance of the saints. You can never lose your salvation, even though there may be periods in your life where it appears there's no fruit. Or it may appear that God may withhold his favor from you if you're indulging in certain sins and you're not willing to repent from them. But ultimately, you can never totally lose your salvation. That implies that if you did, then you have to get saved again. Scripture does not speak of that. Sanctification. Yes. That's the process. Yes. That's the process. Yes. You're not totally sanctified until you're saved. Right. So, again, this is a timeline. So, points in time indicate no duration, they happen in an instant. But external call, for example, general revelation, that has a time duration associated with it. Again, we've got to get to glory. We're not there. So somehow we got to take this green line and make progress. And we're going to do that, but we've got to go through the order of salvation. We've got to talk about what's happening right here the moment we get saved. Good questions. Okay, you want to try and make some progress? <laughs> oh, by the way, um, we're not trying to give you dyslexia. So the bottom half of the board is for Pastor Phillips' Wednesday night study. So it's upside down. Uh, it's not part of the timeline. I've been hogging the whiteboard, so he had to uh, overlay his notes on mine. Oh, that's Hebrew. Yeah. <laughs> so again, and some of it's in Greek. Uh, but you can ignore the bottom of the board. That's that's for Phillips Wednesday, Wednesday night study. So, okay, so we're here. So we're we're talking about your jaspogy still election, effectual call, regeneration. That's where we stopped things last week. And again, for anybody that came in, there is a handout. Um, and as I mentioned last week, I decided on on this handout rather than have fill in the blanks, you guys got the notes. These are this, the handout you have is the same handout I have. There's, I think there's some in the back. They're all gone? Okay, I stand corrected. There's no more in the back. <laughs> if anybody would like a copy, let me know and I can get you one. I can't walk today. Thanks to the city. <laughs> so Philip alluded to the larger catechism, which is what he was reading to. I wanted to read just a little bit out of um, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 14, and also chapter 15. Um, so, yeah, boy, I don't want to... Just use the wall. Well, I think, I think his stuff on the bottom was just like a, this is what's coming in, so... Yeah. No, I'll leave that there. So just, I'm going to write small, I'm sorry. But, but you guys have this in your notes. So, so we are in regeneration. And we said it's not just regeneration. It includes conversion. And what is conversion? It's got two main attributes. It has faith and repentance. And again, just as an overview, I apologize, but I, I think this will be a good review. We gave the example that when God changes the heart, the Holy Spirit has illuminated the mind, it allows man to become active. Up to this point, man has been passive. God has been doing all the work. God did all the work in election. He did all the work in effectual call. And he did all the work in regeneration. You didn't do anything to change your heart. God did. You didn't do anything to become spiritually aware of the things of God intellectually. The Holy Spirit did that. But at the moment that this occurs, man becomes active. So God is supplying the power by illuminating your mind, by regenerating your heart. And now man actually becomes active. And he becomes active 
through conversion. And what happens at conversion? Two things. So if man is dead and all of a sudden he becomes alive, he gets a heart of flesh, he understands the things of God, he can do two things. And I gave the example that if I walk towards something, I'm not just walking towards something, but I'm also walking away from something. So this is the process of conversion. We turn to Christ, and at the very same time, we turn from our sin. That's what happens at conversion. We turn to Christ in faith, and we turn from our sin in repentance. So that's what's going on at this moment of regeneration. This is man being active, and this is man being active because he wants to be active. There's nobody forcing him towards God. He is free in his will to freely embrace Christ and to begin to understand his sin and be mortified by his sin. So that's what happens right here at this moment. And I just want to read a couple of questions out of the, this is the actual confession of faith, so not the larger catechism. I do have these questions here in the handout on the larger catechism, and I'll leave those for you. But so this is talking about breaking it down into the faith part and the repentance part. So on saving faith, which is chapter 14, the very first paragraph says the grace of faith. So again, right there, grace is a gift of God. It's, it's all of God. He's free to give it. So the man doesn't contribute to this. This is God giving faith. It says, the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also, and by the administration of the sacraments and prayer, it is increased and strengthened. So again, it's talking about this specific moment in time. You may have been experiencing this pull towards God through your external call, but then all of a sudden when it becomes effective, God is giving you this free grace, this, this, so you can accept Christ in faith. And then it says, paragraph 2, By this faith a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word, for the authority of God himself speaking therein, and acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth, yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But the principal acts of saving faith, and this is where man is active, the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon, resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. So, so God gives you this free gift of grace that allows you to turn to Christ in faith. <coughs> and then just a little bit on the repentance part, so this is chapter 15. What is repentance? Our confession says, Repentance unto life is an evangelical grace, again a grace, a free gift, the doctrine whereof is to be preached by every minister of the gospel, as well as that of faith in Christ. So this is the gospel message. This is spreading the good news. So repentance is a free grace. And then paragraph two, by it, a sinner out of the sight and sense, not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins as contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God. And upon the apprehension of his mercy in Christ to such as are penitent, speaking about each one of us, so grieves for and hates his sins as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. And I want to read a little bit more because I think this is good uh, information to think about. Uh, paragraph 3, although repentance be not rested in as any satisfaction for sin, or any cause of the pardon thereof, which is the act of God's free grace in Christ. Yet it is of such necessity to all sinners that none may expect pardon without it. 
Okay, so you can't say I accept Christ, but I don't repent of my sins. That's contradictory. That would indicate uh, a question of, are you really, have you really received this effectual call and regenerated heart? Uh, God's plan can't be thwarted, so you can't accept Christ and not repent of your sins. There's, there's no one in that category. Uh, freely, we accept Christ and we repent of our sins. Um, so any questions on that? So now we're talking about what happens at conversion. God enables man to move towards Christ and to repent of sins. Any, any thoughts or questions on that? Okay, so here's a good, here's a good time for the coin analogy. Have you guys heard this? So faith and repentance, I forgot my coin. I'm just going to bring a coin. So faith and here's my imaginary coin. Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. So you can't separate them. You can't say, I have faith in Christ, but I don't have repentance. They're two sides of the same coin. They go hand in hand. And if you have the handout, I've got a couple of quotes that I like. Uh, one is, uh, well, which comes first, faith or repentance? The answer is, they're inseparable. And Charles Spurgeon made this quote. He said, Repentance is preached as a gift from the exalted Savior, but it is, it is never as the cause or preparation for believing in Jesus. So he's not saying you repent of your sins and that's what propels you to faith in Christ. It's not that one precedes the other. These two graces, repentance and faith, are born together and live with a common life. Beware of making one a foundation for the other. Now you will, uh, if you've been exposed to other religions, there's some that say, well, one does precede the other. Uh, but clearly, Scripture doesn't support that. I, I think of them like Siamese twins conjoined. You know, you, you can't have one without the other. They go together. That's the point. And then uh, just this, uh, again, this coin analogy, uh, J.C. Ryle, he was a uh, theologian, I believe he was from the 1800s, if I remember correctly. Um, so this is what Ryle says. Wherever faith is, there is repentance. Wherever repentance is, there is always faith. I do not decide which comes first, whether repentance comes before faith or faith before repentance. But I am bold to say that the two graces are never found separate, one from the other. Just as you cannot have the sun without light, or ice without cold, or fire without heat, or water without moisture, so long you will never find true faith without repentance, and you will never find true repentance without lively faith. The two things always go side by side. So again, just another uh, illustration that I thought was helpful. Uh, I'm trying to, again, we're trying to wrap our brains around this. This is God's plan of salvation. At a specific moment in time, he gives you a new heart of flesh. He actually, God supplies the power to put you in motion. And in that motion, part of your conversion, you move towards Christ and away from your sin. It doesn't mean you're sinless. It doesn't mean you'll never sin. But you begin to have this mortification for your sin. You recognize what it is, the filthiness and the odiousness of it, as the confession said. So this is man becoming active in his salvation. And again, it's not an either or. You are now a new creature, born again spiritually, and you are now in a state of grace, no longer in a state of sin. Um, I think I'll stop there and just... See if there's if there's not a question, just any thoughts or comments, or is there is there anything that's still kind of lingering in your mind that you want to ask about or share Actually, a good story? If you just comment on what you said, but we move towards Christ first. I mean, then away from our sins. I mean, I think that. That moving towards Christ has to come first. Instead of saying, you know, you're, you're 
going to stop sinning, and then you're going to become, you know, then you'll be saved. You have to move towards Christ. You, you do. But, but in one sense, the reason you're moving towards Christ is you recognize your previous life of sin is not where you want to be. So, again, in essence, you are beginning, you're moving towards Christ, but you're also starting to recognize that what I was doing previously, the life I was living previously, there's something wrong about it or something that I, I want to change. And that, and yes, as you grow and start learning more, it's not like all of a sudden when you're saved, you understand what God just did. And, you know, in many cases, you're like, yeah, I know for me it was like, okay, what do I do now? Uh, but that's where we go, grow in Christ and we read his word. Uh, but there is, it is this process of we recognize that as we move towards Christ, there are things in our life that need to change, that we want to change. Isn't that part of the sanctification? Yes. Yes. And again, I can't start drawing here yet because we still got to talk about a couple other things that happen. Uh, but at the same moment, when you're saved, you're also starting this new process. This is happening in an instant. And then, yeah, sanctif sanctification is alive and well starting with your regeneration. So I think what we're going to do, I'm going to try and end on time. I was... I was asked to uh, try and end at a quarter till for uh, some very good reasons. So you have a handout. If you don't have this handout, let me know. I can get you a copy. Um, we didn't go over the questions in the larger catechism, but they're right here for you. And the other thing that I did put on here, I just find this helpful because as we talk about it, and maybe it's a little choppy over the weeks. I certainly appreciate Pastor Mayberry coming in and, and giving us his wisdom. Uh, the last thing on here is just another condensed version. Like if you wanted to read about regeneration from start to finish, so this is a Reformed commentary, and you can just read about it in one sitting rather than having to listen to me over a couple weeks. And so this is just another perspective, which I think is helpful just to read through regeneration and hear somebody else explain it. So that's the last thing that I have on here is this... Uh, uh, this topic, regeneration and new birth, must I be born again? So where we're headed from here, uh, you're going to have a surprise next week. I don't know what, because I'm going to be out of town. But when we get back into the order of salvation, we're going to move on to what's next in here, Jasper. What's the next letter? Ear Jasper. What's the next letter? Okay, we just did election, effectual fall regeneration. What's next? There's a J, right? Justification. So we're going to start studying justification. And what we're going to see is it's another thing that happened in the, this moment in time. That's the product of our regeneration, and we'll talk about that. So let me pray for us, and then we will get out of here almost on time. Lord, thank you for this time. I thank you for this group of believers. And I pray that you'll just continue to grow us together, uh, to just continue to attempt to plumb the depth and the richness of your word. And certainly, just as we seek to understand what you actually do when you save each one of us. So I just uh, thank you for this time. I thank you for everybody here. And pray that you'll be with us as we get ready to hear the word preached.